send around the uh, mail list for the sacred stream. Um, you're on the, the Menla list, but um, in order for constant contact to keep our five-star rating, we have to get your permission to be on our list as well. And she's the OCD one on constant contact, so see, I'm doing it. <laughs> So if you would like to receive information about the Sacred Streams uh, distance learning programs and other academic programs in applied shamanism and uh, applied Buddhist <laughs> psychology, integrated energy medicine, depth hypnosis, and empowered living. And plus we have lots of videos and um, radio shows and you know fun things that we put into every newsletter. So. Sun is a circle. The sun is a circle. The moon is a circle. The moon is a circle. The earth is a circle. The earth is a circle. The drum is a circle. The drum is a circle. We are a circle within a circle. We are a circle within a circle. Beauty before me. Beauty before me. Beauty behind me. Beauty behind me. and similarities in the, the two systems that we are exploring here today with milkweed. Um, and um, I love milkweed. Milkweed is one of my favorite plants. And when I came here and found all the milkweed opening, I was just so excited. And we don't have it. It doesn't. As much as I love it, it doesn't grow in my garden. And I think it's too foggy in San Francisco. So, um, so let's, uh, let's talk about these two systems of knowledge that we're here to explore and, and, and to find the places where they meet and find the places where they might diverge in their way of working. And so I'd like to define both of them. And again, I think there's many ways to describe both, and I'm offering you one set of definitions. And um, I'm sure that there's more similarities that, we, that can be found and discovered uh, between them and more differences that can be found between them. But um, I think that you know, this, this is a starting point, and um, I'm very aware that we have um, 
you know, a lot of material to cover, so I, it might be a little bit abbreviated uh, in terms of the introduction. But please feel free to always ask questions and offer thoughts because um, it's, it's important to have your questions answered. And um, the, these are both very, very broad subjects. So, um, you know, I, as I say, I may not be able to cover everything. So I'm going to start <coughs> just with a general, you know, a general definition. It's not the <coughs> definition of either one of them. But um, the, the shamanic tradition uh, or the shamanic traditions are very, very ancient traditions that have arisen in almost all cultures that have ever been on the planet. Ours is one of the few that does not have uh, shamanism as its primary um, uh, spiritual center uh, for the culture. And one of the interesting things about shamanic practice, although you have uh, practices arising in Mongolia, in Africa, Australia, North and South America, that might look a little bit different on the outside because of the cultural setting and the difference in the natural setting where they are. The practices are quite similar. And um, it's important to note this because when you have this kind of a flowering of knowledge that has to do with healing, that has to do with problem solving, that has to do with education, that has to do with ritual creation, that has to do with divination, that has to do with the guiding of the souls of the dead and the care of the dead. When you have practices that are so similar addressing these similar issues that all shamans address uh, in the cultures in traditional settings that they serve, you have to ask, what is the common thread? Like, where, where the common root? Where, how is this happening? And the answer to that question is because they, all of these traditions have the same teacher. And that teacher is the earth. So shamanic traditions are designed to access this unseen power of the earth. And the way that you find, there are several methods that you find that again are very similar in many cultures where shamanism has existed for accessing this wisdom and receiving these teachings. And one of the methods is the shamanic journey. And that's what we're going to be focusing on. And I'll be giving you a, um, a little bit more of a lecture and information about the journey itself in just a little bit. So um, again, when you, you know, the shamans in the cultures where they arise uh, or where they work are the doctors, the ministers, the teachers, the problem solvers. They are the, the ones who create the rituals that bind the culture, cultural members together. And they are the ones that help care for the dead. And in some cultures, you have one person doing all of these processes. And in other cultures, you might have multiple shamans that are, that are operating within the culture to offer um, their assistance. Um, so the essential aspect of shamanic practice in the way that it relates to Siddic practice is there is this effort to go beyond the physical forms that surround us and to understand what, what are the more subtle aspects of reality and how are they affecting our material experience. And in shamanic cultures, the shaman is the one who is in charge of bringing that <coughs> the power that is in this unseen world into the affairs of those who are, that, that the shaman serves. Now, 
in terms of Siddic practice, now Siddhas, I actually think that, you know, the original Siddhas were of course shamans because we are creatures of nature, we're trying to understand the, the powers of nature. But in Siddhic cultures, which are primarily the cultures that are in South Asia, um, although you have, of course, other traditions that have similar kinds of practices, the Siddhas are re referent to, or the word Siddha is referent to the cultures that are in South Asia, which um, uh, whose practitioners are also interested in understanding the unseen qualities of experience that are affecting uh, the physical experience. But from my perspective, and again, we can talk about this, there's many different ways of understanding this, but from my perspective, one of the big differences between shamanic practice and siddhic practice is that siddhic practice is primarily individual. The siddhas who are trying to, and, and also siddhas are more focused on understanding the nature of the self and the evolution of human consciousness and their, and by association, the nature of consciousness in general. And there's this idea of, of the, uh, there's a more generally more focused practice on understanding uh, one's own experience, understanding how one's own experience is related to the divine, and then resting in that in those practices for one's self. Uh, Siddhas are often, you know, they often have uh, uh, hermit-like practices. Um, they are often apart from the culture that they are um, working in uh, because they are moving beyond the physical forms and moving into the subtle study of the subtle energies that are driving physical forms or that physical forms are in relationship to. So this is a big difference because shamans are, are uh, they of course have their own individual practices, but they are primarily focused on serving the, the, envir the community that they're in. So, uh, you, so you have these two wisdom systems. Both are very interested in understanding the subtle energies that are driving physical form but they have different focus. The shaman is understanding primarily the powers of nature and the unseen powers behind the physical forms of nature and is interested in bringing that power into um, human uh, affairs. And the siddhas are interested in understanding the subtle forces that are driving consciousness. They're interested in understanding how personal consciousness evolves and what that evolution of personal consciousness is in relationship to the larger field of experience of uh, the divine. So, and this is primarily for individual um, elucidation and is primarily dedicated to the Siddha's own spiritual practice. So here's so these are the, this is a description of the two general systems and uh, you know, talking about that, those two similarities and those two differences that I just mentioned. Now, there's a few other similarities that I'd like to go into and a few other differences that I'd like to go into. Both traditions focus on the movement of energy or power from one place to another. And I have to tell you, I'm a little bit sloppy, and I shouldn't be, when I'm talking about power and energy. Sometimes I use them uh, interchangeably. I, in general, when I speak about power, I'm speaking about universal power, at the, the source of all of the different expressions of energy that, um, uh, that take different forms on a physical level. And when I talk about energy exchanges, I talk about that step down of universal power that people or animals are using, uh, or plants are using, um, to 
create communication and to create bonds and um, to create uh, an environment. <laughs> so that is not separate from the power of the universal field, but is differentiated through the through, and and defined in its differentiation between the uh, in the way that energy is exchanged. So both traditions focus on the movement of energy and power from one place to another. In shamanic practice, you have the shaman directing uh, universal power into, like for instance, a healing situation. Uh, there's a, a form of imbalance that is defined in shamanic practice that is called power loss. And its symptoms are... Um, Loss of energy, depression, uh, anxiety, um, you know, power losses at the heart of most addictions. Most addictions are an effort to ameliorate power loss. And so um, what the shaman would do is to, in order to ameliorate power loss, the shaman would go outside of time, find the source of power field and bring it back in to the individual's energy system to help ameliorate the power loss. Okay. So that's an example of the movement of energy from one place to another. For siddhas, of course the siddhas are more interested in you know how you know how can I you know how can I track the energy flows within my own system, what affects those energy flows and uh, if I'm working with these energy flows within my own system, which one of those, or which way of working with this energy connects me to the universal field uh, more effectively, and what's the nature of that connection, right? So there's this example. Um, both both uh, systems use ritual to direct power from one place to another. And I'm hoping that we're going to have some time to give you some experiential uh, instruction on the way that ritual works. Um, both use the process of initiation to create a ladder for skill development. And again, I'm really hoping that we're going to have time to talk about the nature of initiation and the way that initiatory processes mediate the uh, generation of new forms that are there that are better able to hold power. Do you have a question? I was wondering if there's a back in there. Oh yeah, right there. <laughs> Good to know. Good to know. <laughs> so uh, both um, both use the process of initiation to create a ladder for skill development, and um, the process of initiation is a process whereby old forms fall away and new forms are created from the power that is released as those old forms fall away. And we're going to, I hope, have time to really go in more into the nature of this process of change and creative catalytic experience that is at the heart of being able to build greater capacity to understand one's own individual energy and to understand its relationship to the universal field. And then if one were to have a more shamanic view, then how to dedicate that knowledge to the community. Right? So, um, and both work with elements. And the elements, um, of, and when I'm speaking of the elements, I'm speaking of earth, water, fire, and air as a basis, <laughs> and there are some shamanic traditions uh, that also work with space, metal, and wood, um, and some work, you know, and, and some work with just space, and some work with space and wood and metal, you know, so anyway, you'll, you'll find, you know, but the four, the big four. <laughs> are always present in some form or another, um, especially in their representation in the rituals um, in both traditions. So, and, and the understanding of the way that elements work 
together to form and generate material reality is fundamental to shamanic practice and to Siddic practice. This study is very important. In the classes that I teach in the Applied Shamanism program at the Sacred Stream, um, we look at elements, actually we look at elements in the Applied Shamanism, we look at them in the, in the energy medicine classes, and we look at them in the depth hypnosis classes. There is so much to learn about the activity of elements. Um, and I, we probably won't have time to go into that study, but the important thing to note is that both systems um, draw a tremendous amount of knowledge from um, understanding the elements. Also, both systems work with light and sound for accessing deeper understanding. So there's, you know, in Siddic traditions, you have, um, a big, you often find in many Siddic traditions, you have this emphasis on the um, use of the breath and the way that the breath can carry light and the way that the breath carries sound. And, um, and the way in which light and sound affects the processes of consciousness. And um, in shamanic practice, uh, light and sound are fundamental carriers of universal power. And you will see in most shamanic practices, there's the use of the drum or this chanting or some other kind of sound uh, that becomes like a highway uh, for universal power to move into ordinary reality. So both, both systems work extensively with the elements, with the light, and with the sound. So the general similarities to summarize are both focus on the movement of power and energy from one place to another. Both use the process of ritual to direct power from one place to another. Both use the processes of initiation to create a ladder for skill development. And both work with the elements, light, and sound as a basis for developing understanding. And we're going to be hopefully touching all of those similarities in our learning. The general differences I've already mentioned, shamanic practice is more service-oriented to the community. Siddha practice is more oriented toward individual liberation. We've already covered that. Shamanic uh, views, um, oh, from the shamanism, a, sh a shamanic practitioner will often view the movement of energy and power as arising outside of the self. There's this idea, there's this reification of, the, of energy and power as outside of the self, and the shaman is often interacting with it um, in the process of doing divinations or healings or other, other practices they might be asked to do. Siddic practice views the movement of power and energy as arising from within the self, so it's much more intra-psychic. These are subtle differences, but they're huge differences. So there's extra-psychic and intra-psychic. Extra-psychic is, even though you're in non-ordinary reality, you're, I mean, you're already deep within the self when you're doing shamanic practices, the phenomenon that are arising within the practice are viewed as being outside of the self in, in terms of like a meditation or a journey. And with intra-psychic, uh, with Siddic practice, it's understood that anything that is arising as part of one's investigation is part of oneself, is, is, it, it are different aspects of one's own being. So, very, very interesting. Both offer, both ways of seeing the world offer wonderful insight. Um, but there's a difference between them. And, uh, okay, so then, um, in the shamanic worldview, and again, this is a worldview that you find in almost all shamanic cultures, it, the worldview is held in the idea of 
the three worlds, the upper world, the middle world, and the lower world. And um, the, um, it, you can see this is an echo of the ordinary reality that we're experiencing right now, where we have the sky, the earth, and below the earth, right? But the inner cosmography of shamanic practice describes um, different types of beings that inhabit these different worlds. And in shamanic practice, and again, this is interesting that you see this arising in different cultures from around the world in a very similar way. The upper world and the lower world are places where fields of energy that are described as spirits are uh, found and the spirits that are found in the upper and lower worlds are considered to be compassionate in nature and the experience that is reported anecdotal experience across millennia support the experience of only compassionate beings in the upper and lower world in the middle world which is this world where we are right now there's the ordinary aspect of it where we are and then the non-ordinary aspect of it and in this place, you find beings that are compassionate in nature, but you also find beings that are not compassionate in nature. And in shamanic practice, the shaman, uh, shamans, now there is a huge range of shamanic practice. I focus, in my teachings <coughs> and in my practice, I focus only on shamanic practices that increase well-being. So you're always working in, um, it, it, when you're working in, uh, to help heal or do divinations or um, understand the nature of plants, to figure out what's happening with the soul that has passed and it's not continuing on its journey, you're working in the middle world shamanically. <coughs> so most, although the shaman's education is established first with the compassionate spirits in the upper and lower world, the actual work that the shaman does is in the middle world because the shaman is serving the community. And that and you have everyone existing here in the middle world and then you have the unseen powers that are affecting experience in the middle world that the shaman seeks to address in order to bring, again, the practices that I teach, positive change. Okay? So, um, so this, this Emphasis on the middle world, you find in shamanic practice. In Siddic practice, you find the emphasis on, I wish I could use this word in English, Odala. I studied, I studied, in, I studied um, a comparative religion in uh, Institut Catholique de Paris. And um, I had this wonderful professor, his Jungian guy, and he would always say, the Odala, le Odala. And the Odala means that which is beyond, right? You know, it's like this general, you know, indication of the world beyond. And it just doesn't hold it in English, you know? so, <laughs> I guess, so anyway, so the, Siddha, the Siddhas are investigating the Odala, right? So they're investigating the worlds beyond. The, and of course, it's not necessarily external. It's the internal experience of the transcendence. So, um, and the focus is, in many Siddic practices, you have this like flight away from the middle world. You know, like, you know, you have a lot of ascetic practices, you know, where they're actually trying to like squeeze all the life out of the body to see if they can, <laughs> see if they can get more spiritual, right? Buddha found out that didn't work. So I don't know why they're still trying, but anyway. Um, <laughs> I guess they want to find out for themselves, which is fine. Um, so, um, so there's this uh, shamanic, so that in Siddha practice there's this investigation of transcendent reality and the focus is more on that transcendence and experience of transcendence and the movement into transcendence whereas in shamanic practice the movement is more toward the uh, understanding of the unseen powers as they are operating in the middle world. Okay. Um, Then the last uh, difference that I'd like to articulate between the two of them is that uh, shamanic practice has a primary focus in understanding the power of the natural world. 
This is where shamans are focused. They want to understand the power in the natural world. Siddha practice has a primary focus on understanding the power of the universal flow or the ground luminosity. Okay? Big, big difference. The focus of, of um, the focus of instruction for the shaman is the earth herself, and the focus for instruction for the siddhas is primarily the universal flow. Of course, we can say they are not that different, but on the outside they look different, right? They're different access points, right? So again, I'm going to go over the general differences. Shamanic practice is more service-oriented to the community. Siddha practice is more oriented toward individual liberation. Shamanic views, uh, shamanism views the movement of energy and power as outside of the self. Siddha practice views the movement of energy and power as arising from within the self. Shamanic practices focus on the middle world or on mundane events, and Siddha practice focuses on upper or lower world or supra-mundane events. Shamanic practice has a primary focus on understanding the power of the natural world, and Siddha practice has a primary focus for understanding the power of the universal flow or ground luminosity. And this, this expression, ground luminosity, for those of you that are Buddhist practitioners, the ground luminosity is something you already know about. This is <coughs> the essential uh, clear light that is at the heart of all experience. So there's my lecture on similar, the, this, the two systems, definitions of the two systems, and then comparing the similarities and the differences between them. Does anyone have any questions or comments on anything that I've discussed so far before we head into looking more at shamanic practice? How do you spell that word, Odala? Odala. Uh, O-U, yes. uh, sorry, uh, H-O-U-T, D-E-L-A. There are three different words. Odala, above here. I think it's, um, it's A U. It's yeah, it's oh, A it's A U D N E A. I'm, I'm it's, yeah, isn't it H O H O U T? No. Oh, did I have I been misunderstanding it all these years? <laughs> <laughs> but you pronounce it right. So it's, it's, it's I never I've never actually seen it written. Right. But you pronounce it correctly. <laughs> it's not O like high? Uh, um, the O is is high too, but uh, O the la is a U. Um, uh, then it's two separate uh, words. A U D E L E. L E. L E. Or L A. L A. L A. Yes. Makes sense. I believe. It's, it, it sounds a little bit like the beyond the beyond. It is the beyond. Yeah. Beyond the beyond. It's so funny because you know, I spent a lot of time when I first heard him speaking. Figuring out is he talking about high or is he talking about two, you know, like because you know, it was all in French, you know, and I, you know, I mean, my French is quite good, but you know, yeah, obviously not that good, right? So, uh, so um, uh, I forgot that I spent a lot of time in that confusion. You can Google at the it, probably. Yeah. Anyway, Odala. It means the world beyond Odala. So, so you, it's A U, not H O U T. All right, well, that's good to know. <laughs> All right, okay. Anyway, I see him saying it. So the, the term uh, non ordered and narrative reality spurs a reference in my head to uh, Carlos Casanova's teachings. Or yes, you're Don absolutely Lama's right. Teachings. I was wondering. Here. That's exactly right. That's where it comes from. Yeah. Yes. This expression of, of defining ordinary reality and non ordinary reality called it's definitely a method of describing reality that Carlos Castaneda has yeah, popularized. Yeah. Do you, uh, where does he stand in your views? Carlos Castaneda, yeah. those teachings, those are almost all middle world teachings. Yeah. Yeah. Bring us down. <laughs> It's 
hard to, like, the library is pretty large, and his experiences are really profound. And it's, it's some of it's hard to believe because it's um, how much of it, you know, stops or intertwines with ordinary reality. Like, some of the profound things actually kind of like, you know, guys jumping over buildings and stuff. It's sort of like, develop their power in non-ordinary reality to uh, affect ordinary reality. Right. So, yeah. It's classic, so, classic middle world. Yeah, but you so, have to have a lot of experience in upper and lower world yeah. in order to be able to do that. The Siddic, like Siddic practices, you have this kind of miracle thing happening where they, you know, Sorry, you, know yeah. you know, rise up and turn into rainbows and do this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So any other questions or comments? Yes. Are the geographies located to like Siddic practices and shamanic practices? The Siddic practices that we're talking about are primarily South Asia, India, Himalaya. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the, the shamanic practices you find all over the world. Mm -hmm. right. Although I know that there are traditions that have the emphasis like the Siddic practices, but the ones that we're focusing on are, are South Asia. Why are you are making the comparison between the two instead of, for example, focusing all on shaman practice? Um, because the class is called Shamans and Siddhas. <laughs> 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 what we're trying to do, I mean, there, uh, it's a really good question. Sorry, I didn't mean to be flip. Um, um, uh, what we're trying, you know, one of the things that we see here in the West with this conversion of all of these different spiritual practices that have ever been practiced on the planet, coming forward and presenting themselves to be practiced pretty much all in the same time and place, is the effort to understand what their relevance are in the common world. Because even though we've had these practices, like Siddic practices being practiced for millennia, um, you know, what is its relevance in the current time, right? And what does it have for us as modern beings if we engage in these kinds of practices? What does it have to show us? And the same thing with shamanic practice. It's been practiced across the world for millennia, perhaps with different cultural trappings, but with core similarities. So the reason that we're looking at shamans and siddhas um, as, as a point of focus is because of what each of these traditions have to offer modern humans. And, um, you know, I think that both the Siddic tradition, the Siddic tradition, of course, offers a roadmap for the evolution of one's own personal consciousness and understanding and a way of understanding the divine in, um, in a uh, kind of open-ended way. And um, shamanic practice, and which is very, very important for the evolution of, of <coughs> oneself, of the community, and for the salvation of the earth. Because if people don't become more aware of the, of the effects of their actions, the earth will not be sustainable, right? So very, very, very relevant. But shamanic practice is relevant in the modern time because um, one of the big issues that we have in the modern time is this malaise of the spirit. And the, this is, the reason for this is because the, orthodox, the religious orthodoxies have lost relevance to many modern people. And yet, when, they, when people <coughs> try to find help with issues that they might have gone to a spiritual uh, teacher for, um, they wind up in a psychologist or a psychiatrist's office that doesn't have, a, where the practitioner does not have a paradigm that includes the idea of spirit and actually excludes the idea of spirit. So in terms of a healing practice that includes the healing of the spirit, you cannot find a more powerful system than shamanic practice. And 
The other aspect of relevancy for shamanism is the return to the earth, which is, if you ask any shaman, they will say the modern crisis is a function of the disconnection from the earth. So, so when we're talking about shamans and siddhas, we're looking at these two ancient systems that when they come together and are work used together, are offering a very powerful <coughs> vehicle of not only the understanding of the self, but um, and the way in which individual consciousness can move into greater awareness, but then we're also having the system of the understanding of what it means to heal the spirit, and also, you know, you, you know, whenever you have, in shamanic practice, it's understood that any place where you are having the manifestation of imbalance, if it's in an autoimmune disease on the physical plane, if it's a depression on the emotional plane, if it's, uh, OCD on the mental plane, uh, obsessive compulsive kinds of disorders on the mental plane, all of those have their origin in spirit. So you treat them on the level where they're emerging, but then you also have to work at the level of spirit. And so in depth, so it's interesting for me to be teaching this with Bob because you know he is much more tuned into the Siddic practices than I am, although I have 45 years of Buddhist practice under my belt. I'm definitely not the expert on these things that he is. And um, uh, so, so it's wonderful to have his perspectives on this realm. And I have very strong suit in shamanic practice. So, so um, you know, to, to bring them both together to, in this class, to offer people uh, something that neither one can offer individually, because the Siddic practices are wonderful, but they do not focus on healing. And one of the issues about Siddic practices that, I mean, no, I'm speaking very individually myself right here, uh, in terms of my worldview. I think Siddic practices are great, but you cannot get beyond the self until it is healed. There's all this emphasis, especially in the modern new age, you know, let's look at all the different things that we could practice in terms of spirituality. You've got all these people that are trying to get into these non-dual fields, non-dual understanding, you know, expose themselves to all this intensity of, you know, uh, bright light, you know, if you will. But, and, and they can't hold it because they're not healed. And shamanic practice is a place where you go to heal. I'm, I'm primarily, as a shamanic practitioner, I, I am a healer. That's, that's what I do. I, I can also do divination. I can also, I just wrote a book on conflict mediation. But, um, but my strong suit is as a healer. So, the, you know, what I, what, so having the shamanic practices of power retrieval, soul retrieval, the removal of energetic interference, the experience of soul part exchange, these very powerful kinds of healings that can only take place on the level of spirit. When you have, when you have them both brought together, you have not only a path toward understanding the experience of the odala, of the, of the experience of the beyond or the deeper uh, realms of, of universal power, but you have practices which help you get to the place where you can hold them. And where you can actually, when you do go into that transcendent place of the Siddha, that you can actually hold the power that's coming in because you're healed. So for me, you know, and death hypnosis, the, the spiritual counseling practice that I developed, uses the Four Noble Truths in Buddhism as a diagnostic tool, and it uses the, you know, the, the, fierce compassion, this idea of fierce compassion, personal responsibility, all of these very Buddhist, Siddic, um, and Siddic concepts as a basis. But then it uses the powerful engines of, of the shamanic ways of healing to address modern ills. So between the, between the two, there's no malady that can escape us. <laughs> You know, we're gonna, you know, you can heal everything between these two, using these two engines. You can heal everything. And um, so, 
uh, for me, it's, you know, like, I mean, and I don't mean to be messianic, and I'm not saying there are not other ways of healing that are just as valid and other ways of working that are just as marvelous. I mean, I don't mean to be messianic or exclusive in any way. But um, for the modern time, we have very big problems that people in shamanic cultures did not have, and we have big problems <coughs> um, that people who are practicing in civic cultures did not have to confront. So when you bring the power of both of them together into the modern calamity, which is, again, the disconnection with the earth, the disease of self-loathing, which I'm not sure has ever existed on the planet that it, in the way that it does now, and um, the, the disconnection with, uh, with, with the unseen world that, that modern people are struggling with and trying to recover from. And I, I think that these, these two fields of, of experience are highly relevant for helping us in the modern time. So why shamans and cities? Because they are the medicine that are needed here in the modern time. That's a long answer to your question. <laughs> okay. um, maybe just a quick follow-up here on, on the healing uh, that you just mentioned. Um, can I give you maybe two examples? Um, and you tell me which one is, is probably you know, one that's shamanic. For example, uh, doing acupuncture is, is really moving the energy through the body. Right. Uh, that's probably the, you know, the inner body. Um, but with doing Reiki, for example, Reiki is um, you know, getting the energy from somebody or from the universe yeah. to the person who is seeking the uh, um, do, you, do you see them, these two practices, for example, would represent both practices that you just described? Yeah, that's brilliant, yes. Yeah, so with acupuncture, you're, but you know, acupuncture, you're, you're, yes, I think you could say that you're moving energy around within the individual system with the needles. <clears throat> and with <clears throat> Reiki, the practitioner is becoming what in shamanism is called the hollow bone, as the pass through for universal power and, and bringing that into the system of the person. It's a very good, very good analogy. Um, <clears throat> I could see the Western concept of geomancy fitting very easily into your description of the shamanic Absolutely. process. Is there an element of that in the civic Geomancy, or uh, oh, and, and it, you know, I'm not aware of like a description of the uh, of the powers of the particular place mm -hmm. being any kind of emphasis. In uh, civic practice, mm -hmm. but geomancy is really—it's a very good term, for, you know, because we, in shamanic practice, the geomancy, geomancy is the study of the energies of a particular place. And of course, with shamanic practice, the first thing you ever want to do is, whenever you're doing any kind of a practice, is to contact the spirits of a particular place and ask for permission to do so. Any other questions or comments? Um, do you equate the cities with sadhus and yogis? Or can yogis and sadhus become cities? Yes, I think, uh, yes. I, you know, again, um, I, I, we're a little bit sloppy in our, in our mm -hmm. nomenclature, but um, yes, they, they all are on a spectrum. Yes. But, but the cities are somehow magical magicians? I don't know, I've seen a lot of yogis, you know, are pretty magical too, you know? Yeah, but it's... Yeah. But I, I, I think, be. yeah, siddhas tend to work more with elements, yeah, which makes them more wizard-like. Okay. All right, well, yes? Oh, I was going to say, or her, her shoes with the siddhas. I practiced um, time with yoga sutras for many, many years, mm -hmm. consistently, and it's more or less, it was working with some powers. And some powers. Uh -huh. powers also. Right. But mostly it's with virtues. Yeah. This idea of the virtues, again, it's self-development, right? Right. Yeah. Yes. Right. All in the right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So why don't we have a little bathroom break and uh, we'll be back <coughs> to do a little bit of uh, discussion of the shamanic journey.